Hi, I'm Jeffrey Fletcher. I am the president of the African American Collections Incorporated and the executive director of the Ruby and Calvin Fletcher African American History Museum located at 952 East Broadway, Stratford, Connecticut. Yes, uh, the Ruby and Calvin Fletcher African American History Museum is located at 952 East Broadway, Connecticut, and it's in the historic district of downtown Stratford. The collection is a, um, uh, artifacts and objects that uh, my mom uh, passed down to me upon her passing. And what I've done was I've enhanced this collection twofold. And when you arrive at the museum, you will be going through a chronological tour or a journey, so to speak. And it will start on the continent of Africa um, because that's where it all started from. And then you will actually be going through as uh, you uh, leave Africa, you'll be going uh, on uh, a, a slave ship and get that experience. Now, when you go through these exhibits, you will be experiencing audio and visual um, as if you are immersed in the scenes of uh, each part of uh, African American history. One of the things I do, I kind of do a general housekeeping. When people come, I try to make sure that if I'm not able to greet them and give a personal tour, which is sometimes tiresome, but you know what, this is what I signed up to do. So what I do is I do general housekeeping, and what that means is I make sure that everyone that comes through these doors understand there is no stupid question. This is the place to ask those questions. And I don't want people to internalize and, and just uh, interpret as they walk through. So that is the reason why I tried to do it and I encourage my staff to walk with people in the event that they may have a question because my staff is well uh, knowledgeable about this history as well. And part of the other general house housekeeping uh, conversation I have with people is that when you walk through, the first thing I, I see people doing is saying, oh my God, I, oh my God, you know, I, I can't believe this, I can't believe this. And, and it comes from white people when they come to the museum. And I want to let them know that, look, that was a time in a period that happened. You had nothing to do with what, has you, what you have seen in this museum. This was all information, this was all things that were done decades ago and centuries ago. So I don't want people to internalize this and I don't want them to feel as though um, it was their fault that this, this information exists. I think when they actually arrive on, in the uh, slave hall exhibit, they realize, they get it, they understand it, and, it, and they're able to process it before they even finish going through the museum. The museum within itself, it take, it'll take you a good 40 minutes to go through, but there are 40 impactful minutes that uh, will be a life-changing event as uh, individuals have shared with me as they leave the, uh, the museum. To, to really go back, I started the vision and the drive 12 years ago. And um, I, I always uh, visual, visualized that this would be some sort of museum. Where and, and how, I didn't know exactly. But as we came across uh, the, the town of Stratford and we were doing a lot of programs out of Stratford um, and working with Mayor Laura Hoydick and her administration, which has been wonderful, um, we located, we finally found the location and uh, we, it, we got the keys, turned the door open and we started working. This is a rich history and it's, it's been maligned and it has not, as a child, I, I did not learn what I know today, to be honest with you. And I'm always learning and I tell people just because I look like what the museum is supposed to be, I don't have all the answers, but I'm learning. And I think it is a, it's another mechanism that we can use or another venue that we can use edu in the educational uh, environment to, uh, to give young folks and older people that uh, never got to learn this. Um, it, it's, it's a difficult history, we get it, but we try to make it as inviting and less uh, uncomfortable for you when you come here. I, I think we, we have some work to do. Um, we have a lot of work to do, not only in society, but we also have a lot of work to do um, in, in, in people like myself. If we have this information, we need to bring it forward so that it can be displayed, exhibited. But um, I look at this as being, one, for the community here, a destination. I look for it to be a place where it will bring foot traffic, not only economically, but also um, 
educationally and historically. Uh, we're on the threshold, because this is the only African American History Museum to date that I know of in the state of Connecticut and possibly New England that's in existence. So I look at this museum as expanding and getting bigger. And you know, we look forward to our new home, which will be a, uh, within a year, probably a year and several months, uh, around the corner, which would be the John W. Sterling Homestead, which is on uh, 2223 um, East Main Street. I'm sorry, Main Street. So in this space here, um, I wanted to uh, replicate what it was like to be in a slave ship in the hull. And in the slave ship, uh, in this space, we have a uh, horizontal section of what it was like to be um, in a berth uh, so when we look in these history books, we see in the hull of the ships human beings, or as I like to call them, souls that are stacked on each other, stacked beside each other. And uh, I want people to get the sense of they're in an enclosed space and they have the audio effects of women, children, and men talking and crying as uh, they're making their journey across the uh, Atlantic. So people can actually read these um, manuscripts and different newspapers that come from the time period. This comes from a Louisiana newspaper. So we all know that English, French, and Spanish was uh, um, uh, influenced in Louisiana. So in these newspapers in Louisiana, they came out in French, they came out in uh, English, they came out in Spanish. And in these newspapers, every one of them, they had in the section, almost like what we see today in um, want ads, but you see where uh, enslaved people have ran away from the plantations or have gone somewhere else or straight away. So they are automatically placed in these newspapers. So what I've done was enhanced it so that people can read it instead of having to um, labor their eyes and trying to read the actual newspaper. And the 19th century was the beginning of kind of like negative uh, advertisements and um, stereotypes of African Americans. Um, uh, de being depicted as buffoons, uh, apes, um, unintelligible people, um, and but yet in the, in the same terms they were used as uh, in their advertising. If you were to go to the Smithsonian, the National African American History Museum, they have one of the most important pieces there that I call is the um, Pullman Porter exhibit. And behind me is um, a family had uh, donated the, their great-grandfather's Pullman Porter outfits that he wore. As we all know, the Pullman Porters were uh, one, at one time slaves bef after the uh, Emancipation Proclamation. A lot of them didn't have a place to work. They only knew about servitude and they also knew about um, just being manual labor. And a lot of them were working in the trains and the train was uh, owned by George C. Pullman who the uh, Pullman Porters were named after. They worked long hours, 60 to 70 hours a week. This is the, we call it the segregated movie theater. And what we've done in this space was to recreate um, a segregated movie theater with um, audio as well as visual, visual being. When you walk into the space, uh, you will see uh, a, a balcony, a replica of a balcony, and you will see authentic movie theater seats that were from that period of time that come from outside of a movie house uh, in Georgia. Colored people could not sit on the main floor. They had to sit in the balcony to watch a movie because they were considered second class citizens. And plus it was Jim Crow laws. Um, when you walked into a movie theater, it actually tells you colored in the balcony. This space is dedicated to Tuskegee Airmen and the gentleman over my left shoulder or my shoulder is uh, Lieutenant Edwin Dixon. Uh, he was from Hartford, Connecticut. They were uh, as, as qualified to fight in the war as anyone. And uh, when the war broke out, World War II broke out, uh, many of them enlisted to see what they can give back to their country and do for their country. But uh, lo and behold, when they went to Europe in the different um, military settings uh, over in Europe, they were still treated unequal and they were also uh, met with a lot of uh, discrimination and bigotry. So we're in the civil rights space and in this room I want to show all of the iconic uh, items that were um, reflective of Jim Crow and now as I call James Crow but I'll tell you about James Crow in a minute. That's Jim Crow's uh, grandson. So these doors that are in this space were reflective of uh, a time when people of color could not use white women's bathroom 
white men's bathroom. They had their own bathroom, uh, which was labeled colored men. Colored women did not have a bathroom per se. They had to use the bathroom of a colored man. Meanwhile, while somebody waited outside that bathroom. And we also have in this space water fountains um, where whites drank out of and colored people drank out of. And as you will see in footage, that you can tell without words uh, who had the, uh, the clean uh, water fountain, who drank out of the, uh, white, uh, the uh, white water fountain. There's another part of this which is um, closely related to me, which I want to make sure that time has changed, but has it really changed enough after 60 plus years where colored people cannot use white people's bathroom. So there is a door in this uh, display which is now added to the doors of segregation, I call it, which is the Starbucks store, where it personally affected me uh, in the year of 2013 as I wanted to use the restroom as an African-American police officer and was denied the key to the bathroom only to learn that the bathroom key was given to a white man minutes after I had asked. So this room is very, very uh, sentimental to me, but also reflective because my great-great-grandparents, my grandparents, and my mom and dad had lived in this era, and here I am talking about what had happened to me as they used to tell me what went on with them. Regardless of uh, my uh, stature as a police officer, but my stature of a police officer, I, 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 I expected to be looked at as a human being. My uniform was secondary, and that's why I did not press upon it because it would have been considered code of blue, using my uniform to in, and, uh, intimidate her, in which I said, that's not what I have to do. She had to have allowed me to use that bathroom, not because I was a police officer, but because I was a human being, an African-American human being. And when I was denied the access to that, that bathroom, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I cried. I cried because it was 2013, and, uh, and all the conversations I had as a child with my, my, my relatives, um, I couldn't believe this was happening to me.